Right, I think um, we'll get started if that's okay, guys. Um, so I just want to welcome you all this morning. Have a good morning to you all. Um, basically, this is the V Meet for um, the digital marketing and social media sector um, qualifications in South Wales. Sorry, for the sector in South Wales. My name is Susan Billington and I am a senior account manager for Wales within the Educate Group, which incorporates ISA training. The purpose of today's meeting is to provide an opportunity for those in the digital marketing and social media sector to come together and look at the challenges we're all facing now and the likely challenges and potential opportunities that um, are, are, are likely to exist as we come out of lockdown in Wales and to really try and look ahead and see what a post COVID-19 world may look like. Um, to do that, we've invited some guests who are experts in their field who can give us um, a great insight and advice that is specifically relevant to the digital marketing sector. There'll also be question and answer sessions after each guest speaker, so it will be a great opportunity for those of you on the call today to ask any questions. Um, and it is important to um, glean as much information as you can from today's session. So please, you know, um, ask questions, um, you know, um, throughout the process. Um, we really hope that you'll find the next 45 minutes really useful and worthwhile. Um, before we start, though, can I ask everyone to mute their microphones? Um, if you would like to take part and ask any questions in any of the Q&A sessions, if you can just use the raise a hand function within the um, call um, and then obviously um, I'll uh, introduce you. Um, so our first speaker today is Alistair Milburn. Alistair is Effective Communications Managing Director. Um, so Alistair, over to you. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, good morning, everyone. Yeah, I'm the MD and founder of um, Effective Communication, Wales's leading PR agency. So I've got to get that uh, that plug in. But um, before that, I was um, uh, a newspaper editor. I was editor of the South Wales Echo for three years. I was a print journalist for 16 years, etc. Um, Effect has been running 15 years, so 31 years now of um, of working in the media. So, and I just want to give some context to everyone um, to help shape the discussion this morning is um, you know when I was first when I first became a journalist for the Western Mail Wales's morning newspaper it sold 90,000 newspapers this morning it'll be lucky if it sells 10,000 and uh, the bulk of that is probably you know public sector Welsh government etc um, what we've seen um, through the last three months is um, a severe impact on the traditional Welsh media, in, particularly in terms of commercial revenues um, and the advertising. So while most of us like to get all our content for free online, that obviously doesn't pay the bills. The bulk of the advertising still comes through the print publications. Um, so we've seen a lot of the Welsh uh, media, excluding the BBC, being furloughed and there's a lot of worry and there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, and these, of course, were platforms that, in, in terms of PR and promoting your businesses, you would traditionally have used to, uh, to plug your services and plug new products, etc. Um, and what, what that sh increasing shift means, I think, is that there is never a better opportunity now for you to do this yourselves um, and to look to the online platforms. Um, so an example um, we've got is we're promoting a new luxury resort in Larne in Carmarthenshire. Um, and we achieved uh, coverage on Wales Online at the weekend, which generated over 1,000 comments and over 300 shares. So the amplification of the digital market um, is significant compared to those traditional routes. And I, I did hear actually that on the, on the back of that promotion, they received seven bookings, which is great. Um, so that, that's just some context of what is happening. Um, I think to emphasize, you can take greater ownership through your own platforms and use your own platforms as media platforms um, because it is about who you need to target at the moment. So um, I, I once spectacularly lost a pitch because the client asked me how I was going to get them in the Daily Mail. 
and I told them that um, the Daily Mail wasn't the audience that they needed to be in for their product and their service. Um, it was quite a short, sharp pitch because obviously they didn't want to, I wasn't saying the right things that they wanted to hear. So what I'm just going to do is just run through some points that we've circulated to our clients recently um, about some ticks that I think they should be doing as we come out of COVID. Some of it you might think, well, that's just very basic things, but actually it's quite often things that um, are neglected in the heat of the battle, especially if you're business owners like me, where you're, you're just ensuring you know, that the cash is okay, that you've got a viable business, that the staff is okay. I think we're reaching a point now where the marketing of your business, um, for those that do it, is a fantastic opportunity for you to accelerate awareness and profile of your services. Um, so going back to that Daily Mail pitch, I think it's very important that you do understand who you need to talk to. So you know, when did you last speak to your suppliers? When did you last speak to your staff? When did you last speak to your prospects? So you know, it's simple as having a maintained database of those contacts. Um, it's important that you reach out to say you're still here and maybe update them on what you're doing, etc. So regular communication, I think, is absolutely critical um, and is welcome from those um, stakeholders. So what we call in terms of stakeholder engagement and state, stakeholder mapping is important to exercise just to make sure you're speaking to everyone that you should be speaking to. Um, I think now um, there is downtime, so I think now is a good time to revisit uh, the Death Star that I call your website, which always needs constant maintenance. So I think you know there probably is capacity within a lot of businesses to take time out and review your website, and uh, I know there'll be more on that later. Um, I think um, particularly that calls like this, what we are, will see is this significant shift to the online market. Um, and with that comes the digital platforms as well. So I think now is really the time to build a much stronger network across your social media channels, um, LinkedIn, um, Instagram, etc. cetera. Um, and again, going back to what are the relevant platforms for your product, for your services. So, you know, for a, a business like Effective, you know, Facebook isn't an option for us. But if you're very much a B2C business, then Facebook may be very, very important to you. So I think a big danger is us trying to do too much when actually just to stand back and sit back and just look at where the audiences are that we need to reach and then targeting them accordingly. Um, and then... On, on top of that is then looking at what your content looks like and how are you engaging people. So um, there's some very good data around um, social trends in 2020. Um, and the days of just putting content out there for the sake of putting content out there are gone. You know, the, the engagement is simply not there. The, the need to, um, to hook people in with personality, um, with engaging content has never been more important. So content is still very much king even if it's um, on a digital platform not the traditional platforms anymore um, talk about simple things such as improving enhancing your social media platforms um, you know, not I was established in uh, 2005 and uh, all that sort of thing it is about creating engaging content that hooks people in about reviewing your email footers, so what are the latest awards, accreditations, etc., that you might want to be promoting, um, and also in terms of um, the video and the animation, which again is a very, very important and growing area, which I think people are scared by the technology of it, um, the misconception about the price, etc. Um, you can do a lot of video now with your smartphones and there are editing apps, etc. Um, and latest social trends are clearly showing that use of video and use of animation um, are generating far greater engagement than just the written word. So I think that needs to take consideration as well. Um, we always talked in the media that we were we were jack of all trades and master of none um, because journalists do just jump from one story to another. And I think it's even in difficult times like this, it's reminding yourselves that you have a solution um, to your customers. You're an expert in your field and that people value um, your insights and wisdom and experiences. Um, 
So in terms of looking at case studies and what you've done for previous clients, what you've done in terms of um, uh, activities or products or your insight into trends is, is relevant and very important. So I think that's an area that people should be exploring more. Um, and what I tend to say is that they, if you don't, there is a vacuum which your competitors uh, will fill. Um, and I think um, in terms of sector intelligence and the technology now enables you to research more and more what is happening in your sector, what your competitors are up to, um, and you know, taking time again to look at their social media platforms, their digital platforms to see what they're doing um and to nick ideas if you so wish there's nothing wrong with that at all so that sector analysis especially in such unusual circumstances i think is very important um i'm just going to touch on um in terms of um reputation management as well um and that some of you may be considering or have made some very difficult decisions as businesses um, and it's important that that is managed as well as any um, positive information you want may want to be putting out and you know the, the changing shift of you know we, we, we do crisis comms on a regular basis and crisis comms will inevitably break digitally and, and on social media now so um, um, you know, I, I've been in situations where you know there's been a job loss announcement and the people be, it's broken on social media while the people involved are still being in a room so you, the, the, you need to be prepared with a plan if you are going to have to make some difficult decisions in the coming months um, and you know just consider all issues within your business um, is this potentially going to lead to negative um, publicity, not just in the traditional media, but particularly online as well, and how you manage that, that social media reaction, because I'm sure you've seen th those digital storms, they're quite difficult to manage once they do happen. Um, so, um, yeah, I think, you know, in terms of that, everyone's open to criticism at the moment, particularly if they handle things badly. And we've seen that in high profile cases with the, the CEO of Weatherspoons and Richard Branson to a degree asking for his bailouts um, for his various global companies. So um, it, it's a watching world at the moment for us company owners and directors in terms of how we manage our comms. So that's a bit of a whiz through. I can spend days talking about all this, but um, I'm conscious that there might be questions as well. So um, welcome to receive, discuss those or discuss any of the points that I've raised. Thank you, Susan. Sorry, I didn't uh, unmute myself. Um, thank you so much, Alistair. Um, the modern technology is um, a little bit difficult for me sometimes, unfortunately. Um, does anybody have any qu questions at all for Alistair? I know that Tim has put um, a couple of um, uh, bits and pieces on the group chat with regards to some uh, video creation packages. Um, so there are some links on there um, if anybody's interested in uh, having a look at those. Obviously, um, there's some information there. But any questions at all? I got a quick quick question for you, Alistair. Um, you, you you opened up about um, I think the Western Mail. I think you said had gone from ninety thousand to to ten thousand printed copies or sold copies. Do do you think that um, the the whole lockdown and COVID um, has sped up the the demise, I guess, of the traditional newspaper. And do you think there's any way back uh, for that now, for the in the future? Yeah, I mean, uh, this has been a debate for about twenty years about when papers will cease to exist. It's, um, I, I think, we'll see the demise of some, but potentially not others. So, um, you know, you, there's some very good niche publications around. I mean, closer to you, there's um, papers like the Gaffili Observer, um, which remain very um, important to their local community. So the, 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 the difficult balancing act that they've got is that um, the print 
still generates probably 70, 75% of revenues compared to online. So the big issue for the media is that we will all jump online first thing in the morning, but we won't be, we're not paying for it. So how they generate ad revenue online has been a debate that's gone on for about the last 25 years. So I think in short grant, I think, yeah, there will, that, that demise will just continue. The danger is that people forget those traditional brands, which is wrong because the likes of Wales Online and in terms of business audiences um, is significant. Um, and what we, what the effective team increasingly talk about is the, the aggregate. So if you are a Welsh business looking to sell to Wales, you have um, Insider Wales, Business News Wales, um, the Wales Online platform. So collectively, they are significant. Um, we also say that with some leading companies as well um, and, and top brands, you will have good profile on your own website. So we'll say, look at how you can amp amplify content on your own sites and channels as well, because there's, there's significant opportunities there. Thanks, Alistair. Any other questions? Uh, I've got a question for you. Yeah, I've got a question for Alistair. Um, the post-COVID world, <clears throat> as it's being called, how will it look different for, for your sector, for the PR marketing sector? How will it look different going forward compared to before March this year? Um, a lot of it won't look different. Um, I think in terms of um, brands and companies that value their reputation, um, stakeholder management, uh, will remains as important as ever. Um, and what I talk about, and I'm sorry to bore people who've heard this before, is about doing the right thing. That, you know, if you look at the high profile PR, PR issues over the last two, three months, um, whether that's a trip to Durham or um, sacking your staff instead of furloughing them in, when you were one of the biggest pubs chains in the country, doing the right thing is as relevant, if not more relevant than ever. Um, I think the, the change, what, what, if anything that has changed, it is the increasing move to digital marketing and social media. Um, that means that the marketplace there is, in, is increasingly crowded and therefore uh, amplification of content and the quality of the content is going to be increasingly important. Thank you. Any more? Okay. Um, so up next we have Luke Hardy, who is the senior account manager at Spin Dogs. Um, over to you, uh, Luke. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I've got some slides to run through, so I'll just share my screen. Two seconds. Okay. Lovely. Can everyone see the slides? Yes. Fantastic. Um, first of all, yeah, so thank you very much for asking me to, to speak today. Um, there were a couple of things that Alistair went through there that um, hopefully will kind of carry through into to what we're saying as well. Um, but just to give you a bit of background, I'm going to be going over um, eight things that every successful uh, website needs. Um, my name is Luke. Uh, I'm a senior account manager at Spin Dogs. Um, Spin Dogs, if you're not familiar with us, um, we are a full service digital agency based in Cardiff. Um, we've been going for nearly 16 years and work with over 900 clients on um, digital projects. So anything from branding through to web design and development and digital marketing. So we're used to having very regular conversations with our clients about how to improve um, and review their digital platforms. So I thought it was important today to touch upon everything a successful website needs as the kind of um, the groundworks or the basics, just because when we do return to a post COVID world, um, it's kind of important that any of the lessons that we've learned from our reliance on digital in the past couple of months um, don't fall by the wayside and we actually kind of make actions on them um, and kind of use them to grow and evolve our digital platforms. So why now? So obviously it seems pretty obvious, but um, yeah, like, like I just said, it's kind of, uh, there's been a huge reliance on digital in the past couple of months. 
Um, an article that I read just this week in The Independent said that uh, people in the UK are now spending a quarter of their day online uh, and internet usage has more than doubled. Um, so obviously what this essentially means is that everything is being done digitally. So even when we do return to kind of a, uh, a phased return to whatever whatever normal looks like, um, this time period has been a real test for how your website works. If it hasn't kind of thrown up some um, interesting points of discussion for you so far, it probably will. Um, and now is just a really, really good time to review that. Um, obviously, it's been um, it's been fantastic for a lot of people to be able to rely on their website um, and even social media platforms throughout this time, whilst they don't they aren't able to open um, uh, on site premises or you know have people in their offices, whatever the business may be. Um, but it's just really important to remember that. Um, we kind of action all of those uh, learnings and, and things that we've kind of learned in the last couple of months. Um, so what I'm going to cover today are eight key questions that we should be asking ourselves um, about kind of is our website as successful as it could be. Um, there are obviously way more things to consider when looking at a successful website, but these are the things that often you will look at a website and one or two of them aren't quite there. Um, so they're hopefully just some useful tips to you guys um, to, to have a look at your websites and digital platforms um, and make changes accordingly. Um, so the first thing to consider is can people find us? Um, so anyone that's not familiar with SEO, it just refers to search engine optimization. Um, so essentially if someone searches for uh, your brand name or um, a keyword relating to what you do as a business, are you coming up in um, Google? Are you coming up in Bing? Are people able to actually navigate to your website? There's a lot of things that play into this and I could do a whole talk for an hour on SEO and all the intricacies of it and probably bore everyone to tears. Um, but there are just a kind of a couple of things that you kind of need to consider. So um, a lot of businesses, including Spin Dogs, will do a free um, SEO audit for you. Um, and it just means that you're able to kind of check the, um, the back end of your website to make sure that everything is set up correctly, kind of what we refer to as the SEO groundworks of a website. So it's things like um, each page having a unique page title, um, having meta descriptions in place, having alt tags on images. So it's kind of um, got a name for each image, making sure that um, on the home page in particular, um, all of the content has header tags. There's lots of things in the back, the, the background of the website that are super important to mean that you will then rank on um, organic search uh, uh, channels. Um, in addition to this as well, um, relevant and useful content, this is something that um, Alistair was talking about as well, that no website should just be a um, you know, a static um, thing that you, you have up, you have designed and then it sits there for four years and then you look at another website. It's really important that you are updating things like blog and news areas. So for example, in a time like now, um, your audiences that you're trying to target, even if it's not, you know, current customers and current clients or, or whatever it may be, um, people are going to want to look to you as thought leaders to be showing information on what they should be doing or sharing your own experiences or your own knowledge. So a regularly updated blue, uh, blog or news area is super important from a user experience perspective, but also from an SEO perspective as well. If things like Google and Bing uh, can see that you're regularly updating content on um, key topics and kind of keywords, um, you're more likely to then rank for those terms when someone comes to search for you. Um, also, if you don't have um, uh, news to share and things like that. Any other regularly updated um, information is going to be good as well. Um, so things like case studies and testimonials from clients, <clears throat> it's really important to show your potential audiences that you are active and that you are um, continuing to deliver your service, whatever that may be. Um, it's really important to just kind of um, keep, keep people reminded that you are an active company, that you're not static. Kind of transfers through into social media as well. Um, don't just kind of, uh, there's nothing worse than seeing dead social media channels and someone hasn't posted something for months or whatever it may be. So relevant and useful content is uh, the second tip for me. Um, third one is a uh, tone of voice. So I was keen to bring this up as it obviously comes under brand um, and most established uh, businesses will have a tone of voice of some of some kind, um, an agreed tone of voice that is. So it may be that we are fun and we're not corporate. It may be that we are intellectual and trusted, whatever it may be. Um, I just think that at the start of the COVID outbreak, I saw quite a few examples of where 
businesses seem to lose their tone of voice because they were worried about not being um, as formal or corporate or serious as they should be. Um, and there's a way to do that. And it is, it is obviously a balancing act. But the one thing I would say is, is review your tone of voice. If you don't have an agreed tone of voice, it's probably a good time to kind of look at that now and think, what do we stand for as a business? Um, what do we want to project out to our audiences? And are we doing that with everything that we do? Um, and just making sure that you don't lose that. Uh, and if something like COVID were to happen again, um, kind of having plans in place to kind of make sure that if your audiences are looking to you for reassurance, that you are that trusted voice there um, and you don't just suddenly change overnight and kind of strip all of your uh, uh, tone of voice out and just suddenly become extremely corporate and, and robotic. Um, this is probably one of the uh, points that is most um, of a most bugbear to, to your audiences, um, is your site easy to navigate? Um, so most websites in 2020, you'd be surprised, uh, but most websites should be mobile responsive. If they're not, then your website is gonna be instantly dated. Um, obviously, I don't need to go through the figures on um, uh, mobile uh, usage of uh, internet usage, uh, but more and more and more people are gonna be viewing your website on a mobile. And if you're providing a bad user experience on mobile, it's going to reflect badly on you. Um, so it's worth reviewing that just kind of um, as a minimum. Uh, the second point on a site being easy to navigate that I would always come to is the, uh, the navigation bar. Is it easy for people to um, travel to the information that they need super quickly? Uh, and is it nice and clear? I think what you'll find with websites that are more than a couple of years old is they tend to suffer from bloating. So um, the website will be designed and built. Um, you may have gone through a, um, a content overhaul, looked at what's actually on your site, stripped some stuff out, added some stuff in. And then over time, someone says, can we add this to the site? Oh, we need a page for this. We need a page for this. We need a page for this. And suddenly your navigation bar becomes very cluttered. Um, and it's simply to appease people in-house rather than your audiences. With your navigation bar, always keep your audiences in mind they're the people navigating your site they need to find that information don't just and that goes through to language as well so if you talk about something internally in a certain way uh, and it has a certain understanding and meaning internally think would our audiences understand what we mean by that or do we need to be more simple and descriptive and make it easy for people to navigate to um, the information they're looking for so yeah now is a really good time to um consider your user journeys on your website um you can use paid tools you can use free tools for this kind of thing but also what's really good is just asking people that you that, that don't work for your company that you're um you either have good relationships with so it could could be your clients we've done that before where we've asked our clients to um carry out a series of tasks on our website um, and then report back to us any issues they had you can use um, other free tools as well, kind of like heat mapping um, to show where people are clicking. Um, and then um, finally, I'll come on to this again in a moment, but reviewing things like um, Google, Google Analytics, if you have that on your site, that's a free tool um, that can give you so much information about where people are struggling to navigate to on your site, the content that they're engaged with, where you're losing them, where you have a high bounce rate. So just kind of bear that in mind. And, and if your site if you do review it and it's not easy to navigate and you're struggling or even people that work for you are struggling, then your audiences are going to struggle as well. So it's super important to, um, to review that now. Um, kind of tied to this is the idea of strong um, call to actions. Um, so the call to actions on your website should always be linked to your goals for the website. So if your key goal as a business is we want to increase um, conversions and we want to get more signups or we want more people to fill out a survey or whatever it may be, you need to make sure that you're guiding them on a journey throughout the website. So it kind of links in with the, the user experience, but it's also more to do with the language and the placement of the, the calls to action, making sure that you're not losing people. Um, one of the worst things on a website is to not close off the user experience loop with a strong call to action. Um, so for example, if you have a page on a service, say you're a B2B business and you have a service page, um, and someone gets to the bottom of that page, if there's no action for them to take, so if there's no contact us now, uh, read relevant case studies, uh, uh, or it pulls through latest news articles, for example, you're missing a trick. Um, if, if you're wondering why someone's only going to one page and then they're not 
going, going any further or not getting in contact with you, you need to question, are we directing them there with well-placed um, calls to action? Um, again, we were talking about this earlier on because um, Alistair mentioned um, kind of video and things like that. So when I, when I say high quality imagery, this also accounts for, for video and animation as well. But what most people expect from a modern website in 2020 is a super slick experience. Um, and modern web doesn't have to cost the earth anymore. Um, websites um, are looking nicer and nicer and are more interactive and, and more high quality. Uh, and there's nothing worse than if you look at a new website that's just gone live um, and it has low res imagery. Um, so any um, uh, digital agency worth their salt can design and lay out a really nice site for you. Um, but then if you have a content management system and you're in, con in, and you're in control of the, the contents so of the imagery, the videos, the text, it's worth considering what you're putting in. Is it is it high quality enough? Is it representative of who we are as a business and, and what we stand for? So, for example, um, you may you may choose to um, get some uh, professional photography shot. However, if you don't have that budget, stock photography has come a long way. Um, so even just a couple of years ago, stock was kind of a bit of a dirty word and people wouldn't want to use stock imagery because it was cheesy and you'd have people, you know, shaking hands over a desk or whatever it may be. But there's some really, really, really good stock imagery these days, even on free websites as well. Um, so just kind of consider as well, if, if you're putting a lot of effort into the messaging of the, uh, the copy and the text that you're putting together, just make sure it marries up with high quality imagery and that you're not putting, putting people off by having low quality imagery. Uh, and likewise as well, with video content, obviously um, there are loads of statistics to show that video consumption is on the rise. People find it a lot easier to digest information given to them in a, in a one minute, two minute quick video. Um, so what we see from a lot of our clients now is that they're asking for either a video header, um, which tends to have no sound and it's more just to kind of emote the type of company you are, the businesses that you work with and, and give a sense of who you are, or you'd go further down a homepage and there may be a, uh, an introduction or explain a video. So things like that work really well if you have a particular if your business is particularly complex and it's quite hard and people have to read a lot of information to understand what you do and what value you offer to them, think about and explain a video or something um, that's a lot easier to digest. Um, the penultimate one I wanted to go through was um, using social media. Um, so again, we could talk for, for hours about different platforms and, and their merits and whatever it may be. Um, but I see quite often businesses missing a bit of a trick with, with social. Um, so when we talk about social media in relation to a website you should always be using your social platforms to um, generate discussion and generate buzz and then drive traffic to the website what we see quite often is um, we'll start a project with a client and they ask uh, we're going through the uh, the homepage layout and they will ask for us to drop in a Twitter feed and a Facebook feed and an Instagram feed and just to show that they're kind of active on those channels and completely understand where that's coming from but it can actually have quite a detrimental effect if you have um, all of these feeds on your website if someone scrolls down and then they click off to twitter or they click off to facebook or whatever it may be you're taking them out of that user journey you're taking them onto a different platform where they may see other tweets go and see something else and you're not guiding them down that journey through your website um, so whilst we would advise things like um, social share icons on things like blogs anything that you want kind of um, shared um, definitely have social share icons and have um, social icons in the footer of your nav again there's lots of websites that the tendency will be to put it in the um, the, the top navigation bar um, but it's worth kind of decluttering that and focusing just on the navigation bar and then having your social icons at the footer of every page so that if someone does want to find you know what have they been doing on LinkedIn for example they can get to it but it's not taking them out of um, the taking them out of the loop um, and then my final point is always coming down to are you reviewing the performance of the site? Um, it's very easy to, actually I shouldn't have said easy, it's not easy. Um, the, the beginning stage of a project, a lot of effort goes into um, pulling your new site together. So I'm sure um, digital managers, marketing managers, comms managers, whatever it may be, spend a lot of time putting a brief together for a website, going through it with an agency to kind of say, this is what the site needs to do, these are the goals, here is what will make it a success make sure that you're reviewing that on a regular basis. Um, 
ideally monthly, even if you can weekly, um, depending on, on what your business is and what you do. Um, but the, don't leave it to kind of uh, six monthly or, or annual. It's really important to review what you're doing on your website, if it's working, as I mentioned earlier, where maybe some of the pain points are. So where are we losing people? Uh, what's our most popular content? What's our most popular blog? If, if, um, if you use Google Analytics and other free tools to, to get that information, which is so readily available, it can help you structure and, um, and plan your, your comms and marketing through your digital platforms going forward. It sounds like a really, really simple thing to do because it is, um, but there are so many businesses that just aren't making the best use of that. And um, it's, it's a shame really, because uh, like I say, you've put all of that effort into doing the, the content and the planning, just make sure that you're reviewing, reviewing it as well. So hopefully if you follow all of these tips, you're kind of optimized for conversion, whatever your business may be, whether it's B2B, B2C, you've, you're kind of, you're taking the groundwork, so you're kind of making sure that we have the fundamentals in place. As I mentioned earlier, of course, there's always more that you can be doing. There's always more that you can be doing to improve your website, drive traffic, increase conversions, whatever it may be. But these are kind of the basics that if your website doesn't tick all of these, it's worth just reviewing and kind of seeing how you can improve that. Um, just as a bit of a follow-up, we uh, at Spin Dogs at the moment are offering um, free training. Um, so it's typically something that we uh, charge for, but um, as we're delivering it digitally, um, please feel free to, to have a look at the Spin Dogs website and book onto any of these training events by our in-house specialists for free. Um, it just goes into a couple of the topics like SEO, content, PPC, and analytics in a bit more detail uh, and should hopefully give you guys a bit more of an insight if you do have any questions or um, issues around those things. So thank you very much. And yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Luke. That was really informative. Um, does anybody have any questions for, uh, for Luke? I've got a question actually, Luke. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I found that, that really interesting actually. Have you noticed when you've got under the hood of your clients' websites over the last three, four months during lockdown, if there's been any change in trends in terms of traffic or different types of content that has resonated more or stickiness, for example, has, has there been any noticeable trends during that period? Yeah, it's difficult to say because we work with a huge variety of clients. Um, so I would say the, the, the biggest trend that seems most obvious is increased, um, increased demand. So we've had a lot of our clients who we've got a couple of clients that work in the, uh, the medical sector. Um, so a lot of them have seen a huge spike in traffic, which has meant that they need to um, review um, like hosting and things like that, just to kind of make sure that they can accommodate huge numbers of traffic. Um, but yeah, it, it, from the, from the feedback that we've got from clients and what we've seen, it does vary hugely. Um, but the one thing that kind of ties it all together as well is um, making, um, making the user experience on a website more autonomous for their audiences. Um, so there were a lot of clients who over the past, say, two years, we'd kind of been speaking to them about what would be nice to have on the website. So for example, it may be a um, a library with um, filterable um, downloads. So it may be podcasts, it may be um, white papers and blogs and uh, a simple filter um, that they were kind of like, oh, that's nice to have, but maybe we'll look at it in the future. Um, now, since COVID, it's kind of, oh, we need to put all of this information out there. Yes, let's go ahead with that. We'll have a, a resources section. And similarly, we work with a lot of housing associations as well. Um, and there's been a lot of talk around kind of, um, making it more autonomous for um for tenants to be able to go on and pay bills and not have to rely on um calling someone so we've been talking to yeah a lot a lot of people in the housing association uh, in housing associations for the last couple of years about almost a channel shift and moving across to digital um and making more things possible on a website so i don't think anything new has kind of cropped up in terms of a trend it's just accelerated what we were already talking to people about and kind of pushed to the forefront what they thought their website needed and they thought was a good idea it's now been the impetus to say yes actually let's do that that needs to be there to serve our to serve our customers okay thanks um luke there's somebody has put on the chat to say that um the seo uh, content course is fully booked is there still a way that they can join or are there going to be other courses available 
Yeah, so there will be more courses available. So this, I think, um, the, the dates on there at the moment are just for this month, um, but they're on kind of a, a rotation. So I think one was just delivered in the last couple of weeks. Um, so there will be, if you keep an eye on that training page and keep an eye on our social media as well, um, Emily, who's our marketing manager, will be um, making announcements every time there's a new um, a new event or a new training. She's, lit she's just literally commented on this. <laughs> Great. So that's great. Thank you very much for that. Um, we've got a question from on the chat again from David Bowen um, saying, is link building worthwhile or old fashioned now? Um, so I'm not uh, an expert in um, digital marketing. So I am a senior account manager at Spin Dogs. And like I said, so we've got 60 people uh, that work at Spin Dogs. So it's something that I can share with our digital marketing team. Um, so we've got eight people that work in our digital marketing team. So it's not something I could really say if it's outdated. I know that we still do link building for our clients. Um, and I know that it's something that we regularly get asked about and it does still have merit. Um, but I'm not sure if I could say if it's outdated or not, I'm afraid, sorry. No worries. Um, anybody else have any other questions? Yeah, I got, I got a question for you, Luke. Just interested in terms of the relationship between how you see a website and your social media. Yeah. Do you, you see your social media as a way of driving traffic to your website or something, you know, or is it partly that or something different? Yeah, so that's that's the way that we always view it. So it's kind of um, social is great for getting messages out there and seeding your content to people who um, may not be familiar with your brand. They may not have ever gone on your website. They may not know who you are. So when you have something like a new blog or a new case study, it's really, really important to seed that out through social media. Uh, and, and that in turn then drives traffic back to your website. It's really important that you don't give everything away on social media that's on your website as well. You need to give people a reason to, to go to your website. Um, and obviously once you do that, you kind of got people then in the kind of um, the, the funnel or whatever it may be, the, the, the user journey. Um, and you can see uh, someone's, someone comes to us from Instagram, for example, um, they've clicked on this, they've gone here, they've gone here, and then you can actually use that information. Whereas if you're just putting all of your um, uh, messaging out on social and not ever driving traffic back to your site, you're kind of missing a bit of a trick. So yeah, they, they work in tandem um, and social's great for kind of generating buzz, generating discussion, conversations, um, but also, yeah, make sure you're kind of um, driving people back to the website. Thank you. Question for you, Luke, and it's an inadvertent plug, so you can uh, buy me a beer later. Um, if uh, anyone on the call, <coughs> including ourselves, have our own website that wasn't developed by Spin Dogs yeah. uh, as an agency, and maybe you can speak on behalf of all agencies, are you happy to go in and offer SEO services, for example, on legacy sites that you haven't built yourself, or do you yeah, only so link your SEO services to sites that you've, you've constructed? Yeah, definitely. No, it's a good question. So we have um, on our website at the moment, we're offering free SEO audits for any website. Um, so it's just a really good starting point. So, and that's websites that we haven't built as well. Um, so if you're not sure if your website is ticking the boxes of SEO or you think it is, but you just want a kind of conversation around it, get in contact, um, drop me a line. So uh, my email is lcardy, um, L-C-A-R-D-Y at spindogs.com um, or get in contact through the website um, and just reach out to us and we can do an SEO audit for free even if you're um, not a customer of Spindogs. Okay, thanks. Just to add to that as well, with the SEO audit, we'll come, um, uh, uh, we'll kind of book in a call, go through it, and then we can make any suggestions. And that's probably at the point where we'll kind of say, yes, we can work with you going forward, and we can kind of talk through what what the plan would be. But obviously, every single person's website is completely different, um, and the effort that's gone into SEO will be different as well. But yes, we can we can work with everyone. Lovely. Thank you. Um, anybody else got anything that they'd like to add? Uh, Hi Luke, I'd like to ask a question please. Yeah, sure. Um, your presentation was absolutely fab for, for me basically, you know, because there's so much for me to learn and pick up on there. But I'd like to go back to um, the part when you talked about um, adapting your tone of voice. Yeah, sure. And um, I think that everybody now in relation to like the seriousness of COVID, I think everybody changed their websites a little bit mm -hmm. in relation to, you know, to the current situation. Yeah. So have you got any further sort of like advice for us recently for like post-COVID now and coming out to COVID and how to sort of like 
get back to our normal new way of working and things like that for our tones of voice and that. Uh, yeah, in, in regards to your tone of voice. So do yes. you, as, as a business, do you, ha do you have an established tone of voice? Is it ever something that you've kind of sat down and, uh, and kind of agree agreed on? I think so. I'm speaking yeah. as, uh, on behalf of Educate You, but yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah, sure it's related to that and grants, but yeah, but like I was thinking like about the qualifications now that we are delivering and taking mm -hmm. forward as well to give like advice on our learners as well. Yeah, sure. So yeah, definitely I would say kind of going forward, um, kind of go, go back and review. If you have brand guidelines and tone of voice are part of those brand guidelines, it's kind of super important that you review those at this stage and say that, yeah, in a, in a post COVID world, in a new normal or whatever we're calling it, do the, are those still the um, are those still the things that we hold true as a brand? Has it changed different? Has it changed and kind of adapted slightly? Do do we want to position our content and our messaging in a different way, uh, and kind of make sure that's agreed? You can work with so it's it's something that we do a lot with our clients as well. Um, so we work with our clients on. Um, brand positioning, tone and voice messaging, that sort of stuff. Um, so it's something that we can help with, but like I say, it's, it's something that you could just sit down and review yourselves and just kind of say anything kind of going out as of now, do, do our brand guidelines and our tone of voice still reflect who we want to be in 2020? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Alex, I think you wanted to say something. Yeah, just, hey. uh, just quickly, Luke. Um, uh, going back to socials and driving mm -hmm. traffic to to a website, we use it quite um, it's quite a, an inexpensive way of getting traffic yeah. to the site, um, as opposed to going down a Google ad route or whatever. So I was yeah. with Business Wales actually at the beginning of the week, and they mentioned that adding links to like a post on Facebook mm -hmm. would actually re reduce the amount of reach you get because obviously Facebook want you to stay on Facebook. Mm -hmm. does, you, does that make sense? I yeah. don't know if you could expand on that a bit, and because obviously we usually add quite strong CTAs to all our posts head to our website by here these sort of things um, yeah i'm not too familiar with that i don't know if it's new. face facebook and all social media platforms are constantly cha changing the way that they work and mm -hmm. how they rank and how they position things um but uh yeah i think it's it would be disappointing that if you were putting all of that content out there and you kind of had a strong social platform and you weren't able to link back link back to your website i think minimally even if you didn't put a link in even if you kind of making sure that the 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 copy and what you're putting on social is directing people back to the website and you're kind of saying for example if it was a i don't know a um a news article on um what you're doing to um to to, to re-emerge as a business after COVID, whatever it may be. Um, you kind of put um, a post out about that and then direct people to the full story on the website with that, even without the link. I think it's kind of important to, to keep driving traffic back there. Um, it's probably something that I will discuss with the team as well and kind of see if that's something they're aware of, but it's not something I've heard of to this stage that um, you'd be penalized on, on Facebook for, for adding links. Okay, fab. Thanks, Alex. Um, anybody else got anything that they would like to ask Luke? No. Okay. Um, so if we can move on to our next speaker then. Um, so uh, we have got on the, uh, on the call today, um, Katie Robinson and uh, Stacey Phillips, who are both um, educate um, customer account managers, and they specialize in the digital marketing and uh, social media level three apprenticeships. Katie's going to run through um, a short presentation regarding the uh, two qualifications and then again we will open up um, the floor to any questions that um, anybody has. Um, so over to you, Katie. Okay, good morning everybody. Um, bear with me, just trying to share the screen. Um, big thank you so far to the speakers So we've heard already. Um, so it's just following on with that really, we put together a small presentation. Can you see the screen? Yeah. Yes, sorry Katie. Yes. Okay. So obviously the digital world is growing, it continues to grow and we want to support that with our social media qualifications and our digital marketing qualifications. This is going to be a brief overview so if people want some more information obviously we can ask questions at the end but i'll also um happily take any emails or any queries that anybody has 
Um, so social media um, is a level three qualification. I'll briefly go through the aims and objectives so, so to support those members of staff that are dealing with marketing via social media. Obviously, we know that this is grown, growing, um, particularly prior COVID, it might not have been as big as things are now, but it's proven a successful way to market. Um, and there's perfect opportunity for staff that may have fallen into this kind of area of marketing or want to improve their knowledge in these areas. Um, you know, if there's opportunities for development within the career, um, it will also provide you the ability to possibly attend then for the level four digital marketing um, and run nicely into management if that's something that a candidate would like to do. Um, we always encourage continuous learning because it's just so important and things are changing so quickly. Um, I think COVID has definitely put that in perspective for everybody and things change sometimes overnight over a week's period. So I think it's just really important to understand how important it is to upskill ourselves, our staff and keep improving on the performance that we deliver. Um, so it's completed via the apprenticeship scheme. So as part of that, it is a framework we are fully funded by the Welsh Government for both courses and what is lovely is it's not just your diploma, your level three diploma for social media, you'll also gain three other qualifications in essential skills, communication, application of number and digital literacy. These are all fully accredited courses and the awarding body of City and Guilds. So it's very, very recognised and well worth doing. The um, social media course is a duration of 15 months. Um, with the four elements, it does appear to, it could be a lot of work, although we do offer um, exemption through proxies. So if you've previously completed the essential skills at the correct level, as long as you can provide um, certification for that, then we will um, be able to exempt you from completing that element. Um, and GCSEs, A to C grades can also act as exemption for communication and application of number. So it's very much on an individual basis how we look at your individual framework and what areas you need to complete. Um, eligible job roles, these are your typical job roles, so they may vary in between. Um, if you can see there, there's digital account assistant, um, community engagement officer, social media assistant. Um, the key thing is um, when we look at applicants, we provide everybody with a skill scan, which will provide you in more depth the criteria that you were expected to meet to, for the qualification. So we ensure that you may not have one of the job roles listed, but that doesn't mean you're not eligible to take part on, in the qualification. There are some um, things we must adhere to. So um, applicants must be over 18 years of age and they must be working 16 hours or more per week. So the digital marketing then level four, this is the next level up. Um, this is more managerial sectors, which you'll see within the job role section coming up. Um, it is aimed at learners that have been in digital marketing and gained a lot of experience in that area. And they may or may not have completed the level three diploma for social media for business. But if they have, sometimes it's a really good progression and it continues that CPD. It's a really good opportunity to work through. It'll give the career opportunities. It's, you know, showing something towards your staff as well that you are willing to help them progress, help them develop. Um, and particularly with the level four marketing, um, it gives you that external uh, capabilities as well. So we'll support with applying for foundation degrees in some respect. And it has shown that people with these qualifications um, are technically higher trained and provide that digital marketing professionals that we need within our roles at the moment. Again, a little bit on framework. So we are fully funded by the Welsh Government. Um, the framework is very similar. It's with the level four. The proxies apply here as well. So that's across the board, city and guilds. Um, and the course duration for this one is 18 months, so it's that a little bit more work towards that at the higher level. So here's your edge of the job roles for this um, criteria. Again, um, these roles can vary. These are your typical 
job roles that we would be looking at. But again, skill scans will be sent out and we can review this. And if you meet the criteria, then um, obviously we'll definitely take you as an applicant. Um, so you can see here the difference in roles would be the search engine optimization executives, the pay per clicks assistants, your managers, directors. Um, same kind of consistency then where um, you must be 18 years or over and work more than 16 hours a week. It is an element of commitment. We've got to remember now that these courses are fully funded by the government. Um, you will have to complete portfolio work. So portfolio work is typically, um, the only way I can really describe it is your, your typical MVQ. So you'll have your unit set to you where you complete via either written work. Um, written work is an old word now. So we complete things via Smart Assessor. Um, so you have that opportunity to type up any work and upload it that way. Um, you can still handwrite, we don't exempt people from handwriting, but that will be uploaded onto the Smart Assessor platform. Um, and then this can be reviewed regularly um, by trainer coaches. Um, I think it's a much slicker way to um, keep that communication with not necessarily having that face-to-face -face visit every month. I mean, due to COVID at the moment, everything is done um, via Teams or, or Zoom, that type of thing anyway. But um, it gives you that opportunity to submit some work that's been completed and review that. Um, and it bounces back and forth quite quickly. So there's not that wait now, oh, I've got to wait a month before I see my training coach. It can happen a lot slicker, a lot quicker, um, which is really good. Portfolio work isn't just written work. There could be things like uh, work product evidence. Um, there can be discussions. There can be questioning. So it's made up of various different methods of assessment. And that's something you'd look at then in an individual learning plan with your training coach. We also have a platform called Moodle, which is uh, very, very good. We use that for a variety of qualifications. There'll be tasks on there for um, individuals to complete. And they will also be learning resources, which are very, very useful. Um, as part of the commitment then, uh, self-study, you have got to be able to allocate your time to self-study. Apprenticeships are very um, individual. You can take your time. It's about your commitment. It's something you've got to want to do in the sector. Um, and it's very, very good. We, we recommend about two to three hours per week of self-study. That doesn't mean you have to be sat there doing writing or, you know, um, uploading things. It could be part of that researching ready for a discussion that you plan with your trainer coach. It could be a variety of things, but it is very important that we have that commitment there for self-study. Um, like I touched upon then, the trainer coach meetings will um, take place monthly for two to three hours. Um, and they'll be done in various methods going forward. At the moment they are still um, virtual. As part of both the digital marketing and the social media qualifications there will be assignments. Some of these assignments will be completed on the Moodle platform um, independently in self-study time. Um, other assignments will require um, candidates to come into centre. We're not 100% sure how we're running this yet but everything will be updated as soon as we have the guidance from government. Um, it's very independent on individual learners. Um, with the social media qualification, you will have to come into centre. But um, with the digital marketing, it depends on the optional units that are chosen, um, very much tailored to your needs, what units you've chosen to reflect the tasks that you complete in your job role. Um, and obviously then I'll discuss that with people on an individual basis if they're looking to do these qualifications going forward. That's everything from me. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? Katie, um, does anybody have any questions, anything, um, any additional information that they'd like? Obviously, Katie um, and Stacey are both on the call now, so they'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. got a question i already know the answer but uh, it might be a short question to put out there for the people on the call can, can you paint a picture katie of the sort of role that qualification you just mentioned there would apply to what, what does somebody do that qualification look like what would their job type would be potentially what would they be doing in their role 
So for the digital marketing, we're aiming more at digital, digital marketing managers, people with search engine optimization. They can be assistant roles as long as we're looking into completing projects. Somebody that's very much involved in the marketing sector, showing that they can complete projects, maybe managing then a small team um, of individuals by allocating tasks to them, organizing campaigns, Typically, those are the criteria you're looking for for the digital marketing. Um, Stace, the social media? Yeah, so um, for the social media uh, side of things, then we'd be looking at more of your social media assistants, um, communication officers, community engagement officers, people who uh, will analyse um, social media data, um, consultants, uh, media assistants, that type of thing. Um, although we're not necessarily saying that you have to be in those job roles. So um, as Katie mentioned in the presentation, we use things called uh, skill scans. So we would send those out to interested parties uh, to fill in um, and answer a couple of questions on what their job role um, entails, what their day-to-day -day, um, job role looks like, so that if you don't actually fit into those um, headings per se, it doesn't necessarily mean that you won't be able to do the qualification. So it is on an individual basis. So um, we can have a chat with you um, just to kind of drill down how much time you spend um, doing things for, uh, to do with social media for the business. So um, it could, you know, it, it could be a lot broader than it first seems on paper. I mean, in these this day and age now, there isn't a business that doesn't have something to do with social media, but it will depend on how much a person is doing and how much influence they have on it. So Stacey, am I right in saying that the role has to be a little bit more involved than just like an, a, a, a daily update on social media? Yes, so um, I have asked the question, which um, I haven't had an answer to yet, but we will, um, we're looking at a minimum. So if somebody is in a part-time role, um, the part-time job role would have to consist of solely social media activity. If they're in a full-time position, so 37 to 40 hours a week, then we would look in for a minimum of half of that time. So the 16 hours then basically to be taken up with specifically social media activity for the job role to be eligible. Lovely. Any other questions out there? Um, I mean, from my perspective, if anybody does want any additional information on any on either of those uh, qualifications, then by all means get in contact with me. I get I'll put my email address on the chat here so that um, if anybody needs any additional information, then we'll be more than happy to send it out. Um, Stacey and uh, Katie um, obviously lead on those uh, particular qualifications, so they'll be happy to answer any additional question, uh, questions if you have them. Um, so I think that draws us to a close today. So all I can do is thank you all for taking the time out to uh, join us on this Be Meet today. Um, a big thank you to both Luke and Alistair um, for speaking today. Really interesting and informative discussions, both of you. Um, I'm sure that everyone has found the information really beneficial. Um, and like I say, I will pop my um, details on the chat now so that if anybody needs anything from us, um, please, you know, by all means, get in contact and uh, we'd be happy to help. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Nice to see you all. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.